Welcome to Hoobie's Garage, the dumbest automotive channel in all of YouTube. And I have driven a lot of weird 80s cars in my day, owned quite a few of them as well, and I have a confession to make. They all, for the most part, drive terribly. Sure, they're pretty to look at, and they have a few cool electronic wizardry things that make you laugh, but overall, they are terrible cars to drive. The 80s was not a good period for performance, or quality, or practicality for that matter, but right now I am driving the exception. This is a 1985 Renault Alpine, and it's amazing. But before diving deep into the 80s with the Alpine, I'd like to thank my sponsors NordVPN for sponsoring today's video and helping us in 2020. NordVPN is a personal, virtual, private network service provider. With NordVPN, all of your internet data stays safe behind a wall of next generation encryption. You don't need to sacrifice speed for better security either, and NordVPN has a lot of other great features as well. My favorite is the content unblocking, which allows you to watch US Netflix in any country, for example, and with five 5,000 servers in 59 countries. You can also do things like watch the new Top Gear episodes through the BBC iPlayer by changing the server location rather than waiting until it comes out somewhere else. It also helps with anonymity. I'm sure you're not ashamed to be watching Hoobie's Garage, but sites are legally forced to collect data on your browsing habits, and third parties use this data for advertising purposes. NordVPN can also save money as different regions can have different prices for flights and other items, so switching or eliminating that paywall based on region really pays off. One account allows you to use NordVPN on up to six different devices as well, and it lets you have your own personal dedicated IP. NordVPN has a special offer for Hoobies Garage users. By going to NordVPN slash Hoobies, you can get 70% off NordVPN. That's only $3.49 per month, plus you get an additional month for free by going to NordVPN.com slash Hoobies, which is linked in the description below. Now let's get back to a time before Al Gore invented the internet. So we'll get to all of this car's 80s weirdness in a little bit, and it is among the weirdest cars to come out of the 80s of all time, but what really blows my mind is how well this Alpine drives. So this Alpine is the Atmo model, meaning it's atmospheric, it has no turbo, which means about 170 horsepower, but you don't feel like it's low on the horsepower because the car is so light. It's 2,800 pounds, so the power to weight ratio is about the same as a modern Volkswagen Golf GTI in the, the non-turbo. That's also about 50 more horsepower than the PRV engine, the exact same engine basically, in the DeLorean. They somehow found another 50 horsepower for the Renault Alpine, among other things. It just shows how compromised the DeLorean was. It really is a beautiful design, but the execution, the quality, the engineering, it's just awful. As opposed to this Alpine, where it's just, I am flabbergasted at how nice this thing drives. The steering is unassisted, but it's not heavy, unlike the DeLorean or, say, the Lotus Esprit or Ferrari Testarossa. In the interior, it's in much nicer quality than all of those makes, way nicer. And of course, there's, there's the quirks. There are so many cool 80s things going on with this Alpine, which I shall show you in the garage right now, but I wanted to drive it first just because this is this is the craziest part of it, is how well this thing drives. Other than the lack of air conditioning, you could drive this thing every day and it would feel like a totally livable modern car. It's just amazing. When my friend EuroAsian Bob bought this thing for his personal collection, I, I thought he was nuts to buy this thing sight unseen, cross country, and when it showed up, uh, well, I was super, super jealous, and now that I'm driving it, I'm even more jealous. Even more amazing is this thing only has 28,000 kilometers on it, so, well, under 20,000 miles. The tires on it are easily 30 years old. This thing's been sitting in a collection, not really being used for probably decades, and yet it still drives amazingly. Really. It feels like brand new. You try and do that with a lot of American or European cars, let them sit in the garage for decades, and uh, <laughs> they don't normally do this well. And I'll show you the engine in a bit, but it is 
mounted in the back. Power is going to the correct wheels, the rear wheels, unlike a lot of cars. This thing is absolutely blowing my mind from a driving standpoint, and that's why I wanted to start with the drive. But now I'll take you back to the garage and I'll show you all the crazy stuff with this Renault Alpine. That is nuts. <laughs> So despite being a fantastic driving car and just visually striking to look at, the Alpine didn't sell all that well across the world. Despite journalists saying how amazing it is, uh, people didn't buy them. And it's not because they were that expensive either. This was built to compete with a Porsche 944. So not that huge of a price point, and it looks way more exotic. Now for some background, Alpine, the company started in the 1950s as a racing and sports car brand. They got famous for winning a bunch of rallies, like back in the golden era of rallies when Sterling Moss was racing the Millimiglia, that kind of stuff. Alpine had made a name for itself, and it is a French company, and it worked together with other French companies, but eventually by the 1970s it was wholly acquired by Renault. And unlike most corporate overlords, Renault let Alpine basically do what they were always doing, continuing to build these really mostly hand-built, small production, fun, beautiful cars. And this 1985 Alpine is, well, the first of a new generation, and it was very, very different. The body itself, why it's so light, is because all of this is composite, 100% composite. But the drivetrain was sourced, it was a PRV, it was a very common engine to Europe back in the day. And the engine was actually built somewhere off-site, put on its own subframe, and then brought to the Alpine. And apparently, you can get the engine out of these in less than two hours for an engine out service, kind of like an old Volkswagen Beetle. Really impressive. But this thing is way, way better quality than a Volkswagen Beetle. It's just astounding. Like I said, despite this being a great car, it really didn't sell all that well, especially in the United States. I don't even think you would officially buy an Alpine in the United States, despite some brief period with AMC where Renault was, was selling here. Uh, there, there's maybe a handful. This particular one is a gray market model, and it's really hard to find one in this condition with basically 17,000 original miles, probably on the original tires, and the condition is just incredible. But again, as I said earlier, it's equally astounding that this thing still drives amazingly. It, it seems to not care that it's been sitting basically unused for decades. It's, it's just ready to go. And all the electronics, as far as I found, still work. And this is the other reason why I really wanted to drive and review this Renault Alpine, because I know doing all the quirks and features on this thing is going to make my daddy Doug very, very jealous. And nobody has ever offered him a Renault Alpine to review, so nanny nanny boo boo, stick your head in doo doo, Doug. So I'm going to start with the exterior, and this composite material making up the car, or fiberglass, or whatever it is, it feels very different than, say, a C4 Corvette or any other fiberglass car. The materials, it, it, it just feels really, really sturdy. And look at the shape of it. Something about this thing is just so pretty, and these turbine wheels... It's just super cool. And these are actually metric tires. That's probably why they haven't been replaced because they're so hard to source. And look how ancient they are. The tread actually is almost gone on them. So they may be the original tires. The back is inset a little bit more with this turbine look. It's just so pretty. And the window shape is odd on this car. If you look at this window, it seems like it's mounted upside down. Most of the times it goes with the roof line with this triangle shape, but no, this one goes with the air inlets going in to the engine bay, and you have glass within glass, so to look out the rear, which the visibility is actually pretty good on this car, unlike a lot of 80s uh, exotic or weird quirky 80s cars. This rear quarter is also flared out pretty far, which oh, it's just absolutely absolutely gorgeous. So I imagine most people would assume this is a front engine car given how much room there is up here, but it is not. This is just the boot. And this is where things get to start weird because this is how you fill up the car with fuel. They put this rubber, almost inflated donut around it to seal out the fuel vapors on the bonnet. And this has to be the widest mouth opening of a fuel tank that I've seen on a regular car. Looks like the windshield washer bottle there, and then these, these are actually the latches for the bonnet. They look really weird and ornate, but uh, that's, that's what they do. Even stranger, look at these windshield wipers. They go in the opposite direction of about any other car I've seen. They wipe up towards the middle, 
which I shall now demonstrate. And in the back is the business end of this thing. We have a rear mounted V6, kind of like a DeLorean, except way, way better performance. But you're probably noticing over here, yes, that is a spare tire mounted next to the engine, surrounded by a heat blanket. I can only imagine what that original spare looks like 35 years later, uh, but it's still there. And look how clean this is. It is a way, way better presented PRV engine than, say, a DeLorean, where the wires and everything are just are just going everywhere. It was kind of slapped together. This looks a lot more, well, artistic, just, just well put together. And Bob, the owner, told me, you definitely have to take the air cleaner off and look at these really strange carburetors. So I guess I'll do that. Oh yeah, definitely some weird voodoo going on here. Some kind of three barrel triangle shape setup. Uh, probably never been taken apart before, but it still, it still works. And it actually cracks over cold and warm r really easily, despite being a car that, that is almost never driven. This, it's, this car, it's amazing. It gets even more amazing on the inside, that's for sure. Welcome to the future in the 1980s. Now, this Alpine does a great job of combining the driver's focused kind of feel of the cockpit in the great Japanese cars of the 80s, but then with the quality of a very nice European car, starting with the seats. Look at the shape of these seats. They are so odd, but at the same time, plenty of cushion and really comfortable. The shifter, it's off to the left side of the console to favor the driver. Same with the gauges, they kind of surround you like a fighter jet. And here's where the weirdness begins. You close the door, which I shall immediately reopen. Listen, it has an electric popping latch. Yes, it pops itself. It's a miracle that still works. And look, here's the side mirror control. It's hidden. You barely see it, a little nub. And then this thing has three door mounted speakers. That's not something commonly found in the 80s, but you see a lot in cars nowadays. But look at this cockpit. It's just absolutely crazy. This radio is probably the craziest part with all of these adjustments. This scrolls through all of your favorite. Of course, you have your tuner down here, fader balance, takes up all of this space. Just the radio takes up all of the center console space up here. That's why they moved the climate controls, which this thing doesn't have air conditioning, down here. But as if that wasn't enough, they also gave you steering wheel controls. This controls the volume and toggle through stations. That's a very modern touch. Now up here is a vent and then your information center and then some buttons. These are dummy buttons as far as I know. And this one, you would never want to press the red button in most cars, but this is simply your power locks. And of course, your hazards here. And over on this side, you have more gauges, your engine temperature, your oil pressure, and uh, I don't know, your 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 bathtub sensor? I, I have no idea. Same with this button, I have no idea what it does. Well, actually, I do. Hey, it's changing your information here. A very, very modern touch. Now, there is one 80s future tech thing that is slightly annoying in this thing, and that's the turn signals. When you turn them on, you have the normal click and then the beep. It's the same beep that goes off when something is wrong here in the instrument center. Totally unnecessary, but but 80s. So a very, very weird, fun interior, but also very functional, very modern in the fact that it has a lot of things that you would want in a new car today, but still very, very odd. And look at the floor here. You have a weird hump right in front of your seat. Obviously, this is some part of the structure of the car, but since the engine is in the back and there's nothing up front, the foot room is, is huge in this thing. My Ferrari set up the same way with a mid-engine or a rear-mounted engine, but it doesn't have near this foot room, just, I don't know, because, because Italians, and it's also not a two plus two. This one has an actual back seat that you can use. So the practicality is there too. And once again, just look at the condition of this thing. The only thing that I see wrong with this car is the tweed headliner. Yeah, it's tweed. It's sagging a little bit, but that's, that's an easy fix. It really is a shame that the Alpine wasn't a bigger success or found its way to the United States in large numbers because it really is an all around great car. I could sit in my garage for hours and just stare at this thing like it is a French work of art and discover new things about it the more and more that I stare at it. Or I could sit in the inside and play with all the 80s future tech and keep myself wildly entertained. But the best part is I would actually want to take this thing out for a drive, which I'm going to do right now, at least 
one more time before I have to give it back to Bob. Thank you for watching.